started and um, I would just like to welcome everybody. This Monday was the first day that most countries around the world have started opening up in terms of their respective economies, medical systems, workplaces, recreational centers, etc. I couldn't think of a better time for us to be discussing how to open up an ophthalmology. We've put together a stellar cast of speakers from around the world who will be speaking to you about best and safest practices and how to open up effectively, responsibly, and ethically. I'd like to thank I and John Lowe. Um, I've also, we've tasked every speaker today with ending their presentation with one positive thing that they will be taking away from COVID-19. From my perspective, the one positive thing is that um, COVID-19 has stimulated virtual education. Ironically, like the virus, which does not respect borders, Zoom too can traverse borders, allowing us to focus in on expertise, regardless of where in the world that may be. As is as we have a full schedule, I'll be introducing each speaker before their presentation. And I will be starting with Dr. Radha Kohli, who is an assistant professor of ophthalmology in our department. She is also vice chair of faculty development, including wellness, equity, diversity, and inclusion in global health. She's been running a series on wellness during the pandemic with the hope that ophthalmologists locally and around the world can find ways for self-care realize they are not alone in their anxieties and reach for help if they need it during these unprecedented and particularly stressful times. Rita. Thank you, Alan, and thank you to the committee for allowing us to continue to address wellness and mental health during this very stressful time. Uh, last week, we had Myrna Lichter. Dr. Myrna Lichter talked to us about her own experiences and how she's managing. Um, and today, we have a very special resident, Dr. Sarah Al Shaker, who is going to talk to us about her own experience during the pandemic, as well as discuss uh, what's going on in the PGY five year and how their morale is and how they're coping. So for those of you who don't know Dr. Sarah L. Shaker, she's a PGY five uh, resident in our program at the University of Toronto. She completed her medical uh, school in Riyadh in South uh, uh, Saudi Arabia and moved here um, for her residency. And during her residency, she's also remarkably, be remarkably been able to complete a two-year certificate program at U of T in global health. Um, she is planning to do it and is, has been accepted to a, a, our, our cornea external diseases and refractive surgery fellowship here in Toronto. Um, and Sarah is also a mother to a beautiful young four-year-old daughter named Sama. And when she's not st uh, studying or operating, she likes to dance with her daughter, bake and write. So I asked Sarah in particular, Sharif and I had a little discussion about this. And um, I, I I'd asked Sarah to uh, talk to us today about her own experience because a few weeks back, we connected and I had asked her how she was managing during the pandemic and um, her reply was quite meaningful. Um, she said it coincides with Ramadan and this extra time has allowed her to reflect more deeply, which is part of the purpose of Ramadan, as she'll explain to us and connect more meaningfully with her daughter and her family. So Sarah, uh, welcome. And can you speak to us a little bit about how this time and it's co coinciding with Ramadan has um, allowed you to cope and manage. Yes. First of all, thank you, Dr. Coley, for hosting these rounds and um, allowing us to share experiences and their different perspectives during these difficult times. And thank you for having me. Um, I recall when you asked me back um, uh, a few weeks ago how um, I was managing and uh, you were surprised by um, how my response kind of portrayed that maybe I was managing well. Um, so I just wanted to say that I'm actually, uh, like everyone else, in no way immune to the overwhelming stress that's rippling across the world. Um, in many ways, actually, if we sit down and think about it, um, there are many reasons for us as a profession and for me personally 
to um, be especially vulnerable to increased stress. So uh, first of all, this is a global health pandemic in the modern, um, in the era of modern medicine. And as opposed to other challenging crises that we lived through, like uh, the economic crisis or war or even natural phenomena here specifically, people are looking primarily at us for prevention, for treatment, even for managing their anxiety, for vaccine development. Not to mention that we, and in ophthalmology specifically, and uh, in medicine in general, are at increased risk for um, contracting or being exposed to infectious um, secretions. Um, I myself, and I think a lot of my colleagues share the same experience, find that um, sometimes the PPE actually comes in our way um, of doing uh, or performing a meaningful examination in ophthalmology. Um, so I often, unfortunately, end up pulling down my goggles or removing my shield in order to perform um, uh, an exam. Um, there are also unique challenges to me specifically, being uh, a mom to a curious toddler and a final year resident whose exams got delayed. Also a wife to a husband who um, has a small business that got impacted by this pandemic. So when you che checked in on me that day, um, it was just the beginning of Ramadan, um, and that's a month that, to me and many Muslims, it brings a sense of calm and increased spirituality. Uh, so I could not have been happier for Ramadan to finally come around. It was a reminder for me to pause and reflect, and that really helped me personally to put things in perspective and kind of reminded me that although um, we don't like, and I especially don't like to have things out of my control, but in this situation, it is out of our control and we'll, I'll have to accept that and learn to adapt. In other sense also, um, I started reflecting on the extra time and the downtime that this um, has given us. So I was able to spend more time with my daughter and do things that otherwise I would not have been able to complete or do. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sarah. So very briefly, can you just speak to us about Ramadan and how it is a time of reflection for Muslims uh, who observe Ramadan? Can you just give us a little bit about that in particular? Um, it is a month that happens once a year for um, Muslims across the world, they fast. Um, and it's really different from the intermittent fasting that's uh, popular these days. We don't have um, any food or water or even you no know, smoking, nothing per mouth from sunrise to sunset. That's around 16 hours in Toronto. Um, and um, this in sort is kind of meant to remind us of the less fortunate, but also it's to train us how to increase our resilience and willpower. Um, they say it takes around 20 or 21 days to build a habit. So um, we are kind of controlling the simplest desire to satisfy a basic physiologic need for a month each year. That kind of teaches us a lot about our abilities and strengths as human beings. Um, so this also, um, and during this month, as we mentioned, the spirituality, charity, and um, uh, also prayers increase, and people come together. Uh, we're used to breaking fast um, uh, at, uh, in, over big gatherings, uh, visit families, and this obviously is different this year, and we're finding different outlets to connect with people. Um, and maybe our nuclear families more so. At the end of Ramadan, we also celebrate uh, Eid, uh, Eid al-Fatr, when we can um, uh, break our fast and finally enjoy our morning cup of coffee. So one last question will be quick. I know time is important. Can you hear me? Yes? Um, as a, oh. I think my internet, is, can you guys hear me? We can hear I think you. everyone's can internet hear you. is unstable for some reason, maybe. So as a PGY-5, uh, um, all of you as PGY-5 residents have, faced, uh, have been faced with many uncertainties. First, the Royal College exam was postponed for an unspecified amount of time, and then to September, and then without the orals. Um, uh, 
all, many of you in your year and across the country are uh, planning to do fellowships across various borders and we don't know if borders are going to open up. How are you guys coping? I know I don't want you to put, I don't want you to feel pressure to put words in your colleagues mouths, but I know you guys are a close year and if you can just give us a little insight on your morale and how you guys are uh, managing um, as a group and as individuals right now. Definitely. Oh, this no. is an added layer of stress for all of us as a final, uh, as final across Canada. Um, our exams were rescheduled to the fall, um, and to this date, we do not have an um, uh, an exact date. Uh, this, by itself, is anxiety provoking and um, makes study planning difficult. Uh, preparing for board exams, as everyone knows, requires dedication and uh, dedicated study time. For our group as fives, we're all starting busy fellowships, um, and it will be difficult to find this time uh, to study when you're also trying to learn the ropes of a fellowship, um, your new subspecialty. So um, we also normally have study sessions with our perceptors that help us go uh, over tricky points, but now we're not sure how these sessions are going to take place. Um, also, uh, some of us are moving, as you mentioned, uh, across borders and there's uncertainties for visa traveling. Um, so there are a lot of challenges uh, where um, I think the list goes on, but how are we coping? I think as you've hit exactly on the point that makes this time even easier for us, um, despite the challenges. I think we have a great year and we um, uh, are able to have each other's backs through this. So we FaceTime regularly, we come to decision, decision, decisions as a group together, we really cheer each other up. And I think that's important. Uh, not to mention each of us has their own coping mechanisms, whether it's cooking, family time or exercising. And what's also really helped us is that many staff have uh, checked in on us regularly and we really appreciate that. You're one of them, so thank you. Not to mention our PG program director and chair um, also have uh, uh, been all regularly checking in on us, so that's great. Thank you, everyone. Okay, so- Thank you, Sarah. Yeah. And thank yeah, you, Rada. I think we're having a little bit of trouble with our video for all of the speakers. Um, the sound seems to be coming in, but the video may be a little bit choppy. Um, I'm not sure that there's much we can do about that. Uh, unfortunately, um, well, at least fortunately, let's focus on the positive reading sound coming through. And let's see how it goes with the um, PowerPoint. Um, thank you, Rada. Thank you, Sarah. That was great. And in our usual tradition of starting off with wellness, I think as we get deeper and deeper into this COVID-19 pandemic, I think it's so important to focus on how we can all learn from one another and build strength from one another. Our next speaker is Dr. Abdu Sharkawi. I'd like to uh, welcome him back. Dr. Sharkawi was on our, our initial uh, rounds on COVID-19. Uh, while we are getting his slides up, I'd like to introduce him just to save some time. He is an assistant professor of medicine in the Department of Medicine, Division of Infectious Diseases at University Health Network. His interests include invasive bacterial infections, HIV, and multi-resistant organisms. He has been featured regularly on a wide range of media outlets around the world to offer his expert opinion and insights into the COVID-19 pandemic. And we're very fortunate to have him with us today to share his insights on how COVID-19 is progressing um, with respect to opening up our system. Abdu? Oh my. Thanks so much, Alan. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Yes. All right, great. Sorry, just opening up my slide here. Can everyone see my screen? Oh, there we go. Perfect. Oops. Yep. Oh, 
Okay, so thanks so much, uh, Alan, for uh, this gracious invitation. Um, this is certainly an exciting time for all of us as we look forward to uh, the road to recovery through this uh, resolving pandemic. Uh, what I really want to talk to you about today is uh, to give you, first of all, a uh, sense of where we are right now in terms of our uh, most current Canadian data. Uh, I'd like to move on to some modest future modeling projections, which will give you an idea as to where we may be over the next few months, uh, depending on how uh, strictly we can adhere to the public health policies and practices that are being put forth. Uh, the other issue that has been talked about a lot increasingly, especially in the last few weeks, is what's the nature of transmissibility with this virus? What do we know about it being airborne as opposed to being strictly droplet? I'm gonna hopefully try and dispel some of the myths and mysteries from facts for you. Uh, of course, a big part of knowing how we're doing and how many people are immune is having antibody testing. So I'll talk to you about where that is right now and the uh, products that are available right now, particularly here in Canada. I'll then move on to talking about the vaccines that are in development and what our prospects are for that in the foreseeable future. And then finally, we'll touch on antiviral therapies of course, this is like drinking from a fire hose. Uh, studies are sent out with preprints without peer review, and there appears to be a game changer almost on a daily basis. And I'm really gonna try and distill this down to what is really credible in terms of the evidence, and with a specific focus on remdesivir, because of course that's received the, the bulk of the attention over the last few weeks. And then of course, I'll share my COVID blessing with you all. So how are we doing in Canada compared to the rest of the world? Um, in terms of our case rates per million, we're actually doing fairly well compared to other G7 countries, for example. Uh, not surprisingly, the hardest hit countries are Spain and Italy and the US. Uh, France and the UK are somewhere in the middle. Germany has done relatively well compared to the rest of Europe. And the best scenarios are highlighted in China and parts of Southeast Asia and Australia. And this has been largely a function of the extensive nature uh, and the proactivity of their containment strategies and their ability to contact trace and have uh, mass adherence by their populace. Um, the same sort of view is paralleled when we look at mortality rate per million. So at Canada, again, we're doing fairly well at 132 uh, per million uh, population. Um, you'll see that again, Spain leads the way, Italy is second. Interestingly, the United Kingdom and France are ahead of the US and that may change as the pandemic continues to evolve in the US. Now I will note that missing from this slide is Sweden. But Sweden is quite high here as well and there's a lot of controversy around Sweden opening up its economy and not closing down public institutions. But Sweden has not done very well from a mortality rate per million. Um, so I'll just leave that out there as food for thought for the detractors who think that uh, containment strategies and more extensive lockdown measures are not appropriate. So let's take a look at Canada. And these are statistics that are actually uh, just from two days ago. So they're pretty, pretty current. Uh, over Canada, we have just under 70,000 cases. Uh, to date. And over half of these are from Quebec, almost 40,000. Uh, just over 20,000 are here in Ontario. And about 6,000 in Alberta. 
somewhat paralleling the uh, density of population in each of these provinces. But important note that uh, over a third of the cases in Alberta are specifically attributable to the outbreak at the Cargill meatpacking plant around Calgary. Uh, there are a lot of parts of Canada that are doing much better. Uh, specifically from a per capita standpoint, BC has done very well uh, at uh, just uh, under 2,500 cases. And most of Atlantic Canada, the prairies have done very well and the territories have done very well also. Uh, this graphic just highlights the fact that the ma vast majority of cases in Canada are centered around the most uh, densely populated cities. So not surprisingly, you're seeing uh, you know, a hot spot in south, uh, southern Ontario with cities like the, uh, Toronto, uh, Hamilton, uh, Ottawa, uh, and in Montreal. And similarly in Alberta, you're seeing the cases densely uh, concentrated around Calgary and Edmonton and the greater Vancouver area, and much of rural Canada is not really uh, very heavily affected by COVID-19. And a lot of controversy has surrounded the idea of why have lockdown measures been imposed across Canada as a whole, when many of these areas are not specifically affected by this. And public health policy is really directed at ensuring that these measures are in place across the country because the temptation will linger for people to just drive for an hour, for example, outside of these heavily populated areas and just not adhere to distancing measures and other problems would intuitively ensue from that. So in terms of active cases and the trajectory we've seen over the span of the last several weeks of this pandemic, this slide really gives you some perspective as to how we've done. And I really want to draw your attention to these uh, dashed lines that, that you're looking at. Early on in the pandemic, you can see that the slope was fairly steep throughout Canada, particularly in Quebec and Ontario, we were seeing a doubling of cases, you know, on a two to three and then five day basis, which was really mirroring what we talk about when we say there's exponential growth happening. And fortunately, as we have been able to enact all of the containment strategies and distancing and the closure of public institutions, we've really seen the slope of these lines flatten out to the point where we've seen doubling every five, seven days and thereafter every 14 days. And you can see by and large throughout Canada, we've really done a good job with that. With Quebec and Ontario, and again, Alberta being the last ones to sort of flatten out their curves and really decrease that trajectory. But all in all, the trend is very positive in terms of where it's going. In terms of modeling projections, well, what do we have? And these projections by necessity and by design are not really intended to go beyond one or two months. And the reason for that is if the data is released, it will invariably lead to a change in people's behavior. It's really impossible for people to see projections going more than a few weeks ahead and not feel somewhat complacent about what they're doing. And that could obviously adversely impact the way that they're behaving with respect to distancing and adhering to public public health measures. So what you're looking at here in the bottom graphic is the cumulative number of cases across Canada. And you're seeing in these circles, the actual number of cases. So you can see we're, we're, we're just under 70,000 right now as we approach uh, mid-May. And the projection is that that will hopefully flatten out and not rise that much more for, uh, over the next month or two. Again, this is very much contingent upon us being able to maintain not only distancing strategies and other public health measures, but importantly, also a very good standard of testing. And that's the real X factor here, that we make sure that our testing capacity is uh, continually upscaled 
and it doesn't suggest that there's an index of uh, signal increasing transmission throughout our communities, okay? The daily number of cases is also sort of mirroring that concept. You see that we, by and large, are coming down in terms of the number of cases we're seeing on a daily basis throughout Canada, e even in Quebec, which was the most uh, hard hit of all provinces, and we expect that to continue to decline. Again, public health measures and testing practices are maintained appropriately. This slide is really intended to have us understand on an individual level why this is working. And you might have heard the term R0 or reproductive number bandied about fairly loosely. And without turning you all into epidemiologists, I'm just going to very try and simply define what it means. What's the significance of the R0? The R0 really represents the, uh, the function of the virus or a given infectious agent to multiply through each individual who's infected by it. So what do I mean by that? Well, if I'm infected with COVID-19, if the R0 reproductive number is eight, for example, which it was pretty early on in the epidemic here, that means that I have the potential for infecting eight other people just with that single case. And subsequently, each one of those people who is infected is capable of infecting eight other people as well. So that really highlights this idea of exponential growth and the trajectory being very steep on the upslope of the pandemic curve. And conversely, the same holds true. So that if we take really good containment measures and public health strategies to really reduce the amount of circulating virus that's out there, that reproductive number starts to drop because the virus sort of runs out of steam. It has fewer hosts that it could potentially infect and we're doing a better job uh, trying to decrease the conduits for infection throughout our community, our work environments, et cetera. And we've done a great job through the latter part of April and May, we're now hovering around just under one. And that means that each case that's occurring is almost sporadic in nature, and it's going to be less likely the result of direct contact with an environment that is sort of high in terms of the degree of exposure that it presents for COVID-19. All right, let's move on now to this big controversy about you know, just how much of this is airborne, you know, how freaked out do we need to be when we get into an elevator if somebody had COVID-19 in there 10 minutes ago? And how much do we need to be worried when we're just in our routine work circumstances and other environments? So the truth is that no one can really deny the fact that this is really a heavy virus, okay? So it's between the eight to 14 micrometers in size, which actually by viral standards is pretty large, okay? Uh, when we talk about things like measles and smallpox, they're much smaller, sometimes three micrometers or smaller, which means that by nature, they're very easily disseminated in aerosolized form, and they can spread and disperse very rapidly throughout a much broader space, even with very routine exposure to an infected source. That's not really the situation here in most instances with COVID-19, with the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So the two meter rule, the six feet rule, is not really arbitrary in nature. It does sort of hold true with respect to heavier viruses, if you will. Now, that being said, that does not mean that aerosolization cannot occur but it occurs in sort of two different states. The more typical aerosolization that we are concerned about, particularly as healthcare practitioners, is occurring during situations where somebody is vigorously coughing, visibly coughing in front of us, you could say sneezing for the same reasons, or during high-risk medical procedures 
that's where there's going to be a lot of the virus that's going to be uh, dispersed, uh, not only in droplet form, but in smaller aerosolized form as well. We know intubation and re -intu repositioning intubated patients who are uh, on ventilators portends a very high risk for people like ER docs, critical care physicians, anesthetists. We know that to a lesser extent, things like thoracic TCs and putting in chest tubes also portend some risks. And from an ophthalmologic standpoint, recognizing that in particular, the upper respiratory tract and balls, you know, the nasolacrimal duct, when you're performing procedures that involve ductal irrigation, debridement of any kind, that is intuitively a higher risk procedures. So those are procedures that are going to necessitate the use of an N95 respirator, ideally a face shield, minimizing verbal, verbal communication between uh, the ophthalmologist and the patient, et cetera. All right, so what about this controversy of other seemingly mundane or routine activities? Um, there's a lot of controversy around this idea of bioaerosols. You know, can these smaller particulate forms of the virus linger in the air for minutes at a time? Well, yes, um, this is based on some pretty good uh, dynamic modeling data and mathematical modeling that is based on the weight of the virus, uh, trajectories of the virus, and previous modeling that has been done with similar coronaviruses. So there is some science behind it. It's not all speculative nonsense. And from this, we've been able to glean that that range can be extended from anywhere from five to as much as 20 meters. But it really depends on what the source is. So in particular, if there's a high respiratory drive, so somebody has been doing anything from an aerobic standpoint that is going to increase their, their respiratory rate, that include, include jogging, might include, you know, anything uh, that is aerobically intense. And interestingly enough, even singing or speaking, particularly in a loud volume, will increase the amount of viral particulate matter that is dispersed within the air. So, you know, these uh, recommendations in terms of minimizing speech and economizing our words are actually very important, uh, especially for an ophthalmologist where you're in close proximity to your patients. So I would really take that to heart and pay attention to it. So uh, better safe than sorry. I don't think we all need to be terrified of being around each other, but we need to be cognizant of the fact that the idea of droplet spread alone does not apply to every circumstance. All right. Let's shift gears now to antibody testing. And this has really been evolving fairly rapidly over the last several weeks. And the basis for the antibody test is from the spike protein. The spike protein, which uh, protrudes from the envelope, is really what contains the antigenic uh, source that it is going to trigger the immune response in the most optimal way. And we now have four FDA approved uh, products, the Celex, the Orthoclinical, and the CanBio uh, products were all available uh, a few months ago. And unfortunately didn't seem to fare terribly well. The newest kit on the block is the Diasorin Liaison, which was FDA approved in the US in April and just recently approved by Health Canada as of a few days ago. Health Canada did some extra work to ensure that it was up to their standards. They haven't actually released their best idea of what the sensitivity and specificity is of this latest assay. But just to give you a sense as to the range, the sensitivity is actually very good for most of these tests, anywhere from 94 to 100%. The problem is in the specificity. So the specificity can be as low as 
which is obviously problematic. And one of the flaws in the design of a lot of these antibody testing assays is that it's not perfect at distinguishing COVID-2 from other coronaviruses, including many of the more benign human coronaviruses that cause the common cold. And if we go beyond that to look at some of the point of care assays, they're even worse in terms of their specificity. Okay, so obviously this has some really significant limitations in terms of being able to roll this out on a broader scale and determining if somebody is truly immune or not. One of the main limitations as to why the specificity is not so good is because the ELISA assay that's used, it'll detect anything that really sticks to the, 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 the viral protein um, fragments that are there. And it doesn't really give you a clear idea as to whether it's a neutralizing antibody that you're seeing there or not. So that's an issue that still needs to be worked through. What are we looking at in terms of a timeline here? I'm pretty confident that given the amount of work that's going on behind the scenes, uh, that hopefully within about three months, we'll have something that's a bit more reliable from a specificity standpoint to roll out uh, for widespread use, hopefully not only in the healthcare settings, but potentially in workplace settings as well, um, and other uh, environments uh, where we can uh, optimize testing. All right, what about vaccines? Another area uh, that is sort of fraught with a lot of hype, a lot of curiosity, a lot of interest, and there's a lot of challenges here. So we've heard that there's this immense collaboration going on around the world between places like Oxford and China and, you know, and, and the US and Europe. Why is this such a problem? Why is this so challenging? Well, it's challenging because there's a lot of genetic variability that you have to work around here. And if we look at the genome of SARS-CoV-2, there's a lot of what we call hypervariability within that genome. So it can change. And that can lead to immune evasion, and it can lead to what's called viral escape, which means that the, the innate immune response uh, is really incapable of being able to recognize the virus because it's disguising itself that way. There's also some variability in the spike protein, and there's been mutations. I think uh, a lot of you may have heard of this uh, DG614G mutation, which came about through uh, work in California uh, recently. Um, we're not sure just how uh, serious this mutation may or may not be in terms of uh, portending more transmissibility, but it's definitely a uh, reason to pause and to ensure that if we create a vaccine, it can uh, take into account that there's going to be some degree of variability in the spike protein, which is the major antigenic uh, focus uh, for a vaccine that is going to be devised. The other risk here is that there is the risk of greater transmission of uh, the virus in newly exposed populations. And you need about 50 to 60% efficacy of a given vaccine to ensure that that R0, that reproductive number I talked about earlier, remains static or declines to reduce disease transmission. So to put that into context, in a good year, the influenza vaccine might be around 40 to 50% in terms of its efficacy. So this is not a simple ask. This is a tall order that's gonna take a great deal of ingenuity and work to ensure that we can make that standard. All right, so who's leading the pack here? There's a lot being made about this Oxford vaccine, why it's most promising. And it is for a few reasons. So the name for it is the, is the chimp adenovirus uh, Oxford 1N COVID-19, okay? And the reason that this is important is that it was derived based on uh, testing that was done in human volunteers a year ago on a very similar vaccine product. It was deemed to be very safe. 
for those human volunteers. So the Oxford group were basically able to get a leg up and to pass through a preliminary safety phase faster than everybody else would have. Um, because they use the, the chimp model there, they were also able to test this in rhesus macaques and the efficacy data there looks very good and the safety data also looks very good. Excuse me. And the adenovirus is a nice vector that helps a trigger a more immunogenic response along with the spike protein. So we already tested 5,000 monkeys. They're hoping to test up to 6,000 human volunteers uh, by the end of this month. And so that's very promising. Uh, if the uh, animal data translates to human data, uh, there's this old uh, sneaky adage in vaccinology that says uh, mice lie and monkeys don't tell the truth. Uh, so we're hopeful that that's not necessarily what adds up here when we talk about this situation. Okay, And they're doing a very interesting uh, trial now in the UK where they're actually randomizing volunteers um, to either this vaccine or to the meningitis vaccine, which is, is interesting. Um, so they're actually uh, doing some, some really good public health benefit to people they are not receiving placebo. All right, so there's a lot of unanswered questions here. I've sort of highlighted that first point that we don't know if the animal data success is going to translate into to the same thing in humans. We really don't know what is the level of the antibody titers that's going to be needed for protection. How durable is that protection going to be vis-a-vis -vis the presence of neutralizing antibodies? Are we going to need boosters? A lot of vaccine experts are thinking we probably are going to need boosters based on all of those challenges I mentioned earlier around uh, viral escape, hypervariability in the genome, etc. And another interesting point of concern is this idea of immune enhancement. The possibility that the vaccine can actually trigger an adverse reaction. So it could lead to some sort of immune dysregulation and actually lead to some sort of, um, you know, uh, pseudo viral infection that's almost a lesser form of the virus itself. And that's a theoretical concern with pretty much any vaccine, uh, particularly with one that has uh, a vector along with it like adenovirus. I'm hoping that this is not a significant concern moving forward. The final point here that's a bit of a challenge with the vaccine is it's a bit of a race against time. And it's somewhat of a paradox in that in order to actually know with some degree of confidence uh, how efficacious the vaccine is, you actually need enough circulating virus within your community to know that it's effective because it's working and providing immunity to the vaccine recipient and not because the degree of community transmission is just so low that you would not have picked up the virus regardless. So it's a bit of a paradox. We kind of have to make sure that the vaccine trials are done and assessed and analyzed while there's enough community transmission going on, you can't do it in a place like Australia, for example, where, or New Zealand, where the degree of uh, community transmission is so low that it's anyone's guess what's going on. Did the vaccine work? Or a placebo would have done just the same. Okay, So that's, that's a really important point that I think uh, is going to put a lot of pressure on uh, vaccine developers. All right, last point here. The therapeutic drug targets are many. Uh, unfortunately, very few to date have borne any fruit. The virus attaches through the ACE2 receptor to the cell through the spike protein. Some degree of inhibition is believed to be modulated by the anti-malarial drugs, uh, uh, Plaquenil and uh, Chloroquine. Right now, uh, it would appear that those agents do not appear to be effective at all from a therapeutic standpoint. The jury is still out in terms of whether they will be helpful from a prophylactic standpoint. There's a lot of studies 
underway both in healthcare workers and other high risk populations. I'm not closing the door on that, but from an efficacy standpoint, I think the data is pretty compelling at this point that these drugs do not help. Um, if we move further down into you know, uh, encoding into the uh, host genome, uh, drugs like Arpadol do not seem to be very helpful. Uh, uncoding and through uh, protein uh, function, the older HIV drugs like uh, clopinavir, ritonavir, again, haven't proven to be very successful from a treatment standpoint, but they are still being examined from a prophylactic standpoint and as an adjunct to uh, other regimens uh, that are sort of a multi-pronged point of view, including with some of the other direct antivirals, which leads me to, of course, remdesivir, okay? Uh, that's the inhibitor of this RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, polym polymerase, excuse me, which is the last really important step between viral assembly and leaving the host cell to infect other cells. What do we know about remdesivir? How much is hope and how much is hype? Well, the earlier data was not very reassuring, and that was from China, where they only managed to enroll uh, 237 patients, all of whom had severe disease. And unfortunately, by any metric, there was no significant improvement when you compared remdesivir to other therapies or the standard of care. And so we are left with this much heralded study from Anthony Fauci's group, uh, the ACCTT trial, the Adaptive Collaborative uh, Therapeutic Trial, which fortunately had over a thousand patients. It was multi-site and it was good from the point of view that it spanned all sorts of severity uh, scales. It did show that there was improvement with remdesivir from 11 to 15 days compared to placebo, and that did meet statistical significance. From a mortality standpoint, at a month, this was maybe less compelling. It was 8% compared to 11.6%, and this didn't meet statistical significance. So that P level should be at less than 0 0.05. You can say, well, <clears throat> you missed it by a hair, but when you're enrolling over a thousand patients, you'd hope to have some greater measure of confidence that you're meeting that statistically significant threshold and not just barely doing so. So that's where I think it's giving some of us some pause not to really get too, too excited about this as being a game changer. And we can't uh, uh, completely dismiss the fact that it's not a completely benign drug. Uh, the rates of hepatotoxicity are anywhere from around three to five percent and they can be limited, especially to patients with other underlying risk factors. Okay, so what does that mean in terms of where we're going? The reality is it's probably going to become standard of care at some point relatively soon, simply because we don't have anything better. So are we going to call this a glorified Tamiflu? It's probably unfair to give it the same sort of designation the data is probably better, and um, I think the circumstances are very different. So for those reasons, I expect remdesivir to probably move from a compassionate release clinical trial point of view to one that is probably more widely available, at least for patients who have moderate to severe disease. The timeline for that, difficult to say. Health Canada will obviously have the final say on that. And last but not least, what are the hidden blessings here? So this is a snapshot of the Gardner Expressway. And I live in Mississauga. And ordinarily, this is not what I see when I leave my home to come to work in the morning, even when I leave at the ripe hour of 645. And so this is a pleasant scene for me, not because it's easy to get to work, but because it means that the hour and a half or more that I spend commuting is an hour and a half that I now have to spend time with my patients, to engage with my colleagues, and to spend more valuable time with my family, both in the morning and when I come back. 
and I'm sure that it's brought down my blood pressure uh, a few points and uh, has reduced the pollution standpoint within our city. And uh, I'm sure that this is not something that's going to persist as we open things up. But for now, I'm very grateful for that blessing. I apologize. I think I've probably gone way over my allotted time. Abdu, thank you. That was fantastic. Abdu, thank uh, you I think so much. I appreciate the talk. That was. Oh, oh sorry, Alan. I, I was just going to mention to the audience we, we have the chat box going. We're going to save the questions for Abdu for a few minutes. We have Eddie Alfonso, who we, who we have for only a few more minutes. We're going to go to his talk first, and I'll hand it over to Alan to introduce him. And we will come back to the questions, for, I promise, because I know that's a very hot topic. Okay, so it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Alfonso. Uh, Dr. Alfonso is Director of the Bascom Palmer Eye Institute, Chairman of the Department of Ophthalmology and holder of the Kathleen and Stanley Glasser Chair at the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine. He is a physician, surgeon, professor, researcher, and administrator. He is known for his clinical and research expertise in corneal surgery, ocular microbiology, administrative skills in healthcare, since national rankings began, U.S. News and World Report has named the Baskin Palmer Eye Institute in the top two and first places 17 times consecutively. Dr. Alfonso was named as CEO of the year by South Florida Business and named one of the 100 most influential leaders in South Florida. He has been included in the Best Doctors in America by Woodward and White since 1994 Top Doctors in the United States by Castle Connolly since 2000, the 100 most influential ophthalmologist power list by the ophthalmologist since 2004, and Florida trend list of most influential leaders since 2018. I think we're very fortunate today to have Dr. Eddie Alfonso come to speak to us about opening up the operating rooms. Eddie? Thank you, thank you, Alan, and uh, it's really wow. This uh, lecture I just listened to is uh, really jam-packed. I'm glad you're recording it because I'm going to have to listen to it at least uh, five times to capture all the good information that was in it. One of the best ones I've heard on uh, COVID. So thank you, and uh, yeah, uh, you know, in South Florida, where uh, we prepared for the worst, uh, which was a good thing, and uh, we worked. Uh, our way out of the worst and fortunately uh, that has uh, given us the opportunity for uh, recovery and I'm just going to share with you uh, some of the slides uh, let me see if I can make my slides work here uh, of what uh, of what we had to do so as you can see here our uh, average daily volumes uh, from a baseline to where we had to go in March as we decreased uh, significantly and then in April, where we stopped altogether, uh, not only elective patient visits, but also elective surgery, uh, really uh, took a big hit on us. And as much as there is a virus concern uh, for all of us, there is a huge financial concern uh, that affects the, all the population, uh, I'm sure, uh, here in Canada. So uh, what we did for uh, caring for patients uh, with COVID is that we had to rearrange uh, many of the things that we did, just like you all have done uh, too in ophthalmology. And um, with a little bit more time, I was hoping to share uh, more of these uh, kind of uh, things we did, because I'm sure I could learn from many of you. But here's a slide that I know is being recorded, so uh, you can come back to it uh, later and, uh, and review it. But uh, some of the things we did, of course, was uh, this is the entrance to our eye hospital. And uh, we had to uh, really stop everyone at the door and we set up uh, rooms outside the hospital so that if patients came in with conjunctivitis, we could see them there. Uh, we uh, then inside the lobby of the hospital, we set up a negative pressure uh, containment room so that if there was a COVID positive uh, patient coming into the eye hospital uh, for any uh, procedure that was going to be needed for uh, a site a saving, uh, we could put them into the uh, negative pressure room. And also in the operating room, uh, we set up uh, two rooms, and that's the uh, part on the right, uh, two operating rooms that were also um, negative pressure rooms. So we've actually continued to use these rooms uh, uh, throughout this uh, pandemic. 
uh, continuously for uh, cases that we're doing. Um, uh, we've also expanded significantly uh, in terms of the uh, virtual uh, patient uh, visits, and uh, we've developed something called a hybrid uh, visit that uh, Dr. Rania Habash presented at a uh, seminar that was given by the American Academy of Ophthalmology about three weeks ago. And so uh, many of the colleagues uh, have adopted these hybrid visits with uh, IOP uh, drive-throughs, as you see here, uh, Saturday image clinics only, where patients just come for the imaging and then the doctors uh, communicate with them in a, a, a telemedicine environment. Uh, a pre-visit with technicians, many of the things that we all do uh, require at least to check a vision, maybe do a fundus photography. Um, and uh, we've done that uh, to be able to uh, uh, minimize the physical presence of patients uh, in our facilities. This is just a workflow of the hybrid visits. And again, I am not gonna go through the details, but it just shows how we had to work uh, in the environment we have at Baskin Palmer, uh, a workflow to engage um, all of our technicians uh, and minimize the amount of time that the patient actually uh, spends. And again, you'll have this available in the recording. And this is also, uh, so this is the continuation of the uh, hybrid visits, we uh, canceled a significant number of patients. And so in order to accommodate uh, the uh, uh, patients that needed to com come back so we could decide if they needed surgery or not, uh, we've had to use these hybrid visits significantly. In order to do that for us anterior segment surgeons, uh, we've used two things. One is the uh, recording, video recording system of the Hackstrite uh, slit lamp and that uh, embeds itself into the electronic health record of the patient. So uh, I can have a technician do the slit lamp exam uh, uh, based on um, some uh, uh, indications that we have for them, and then I can review it at any time. And we also have uh, in the emergency room what we call a drone a slit lamp that I can control remotely uh, from home. Uh, and so a, a nurse or a technician can sit the patient at this remote uh, slit lamp, remote drone slit lamp, and then I can control it. Uh, this is for more specialized uh, exams that we may not be able to capture well with the um, uh, video uh, slit lamp. Uh, so this is uh, how we tracked our uh, inpatient or, or our in-person uh, visits. This is the green, the in the in-person visits and the Blue is the uh, uh, virtual visits, and we have continued to go up uh, as we have uh, really gotten used to doing these. And um, in terms of our recovery plan, uh, we had canceled uh, 24,000 uh, patient visits uh, when we uh, put a stop to that in uh, on March 19th, and uh, about a thousand patients. So we are now so slowly creeping back to bring these patients into our facilities as Alan said at the beginning since last week. So this is how, uh, what a uh, steep a drop we had in, uh, in patient visits uh, sort of uh, around that time of uh, uh, March. And you can see that it was already beginning to drop as patients were concerned about coming to the healthcare facilities. Um, so uh, this is the uh, number of surgical uh, cancellations and visit uh, cancellations. So here you can see the different uh, subspecialties and of course uh, the group that uh, continued uh, to see patients uh, on a higher number was uh, the retina group uh, because they um, in fact needed to do um, injections. So here you can see that retina um, and uh, pediatrics were low in terms of number of cancellations. Uh, this is where we are now, uh, and again, these are the different uh, Bascom Palmer Eye Centers, and these are the uh, clinic visits, and as you can see here, uh, this was uh, kind of our baseline volume in January, which is one of the busiest months that we have, a significant drop in March and April, um, and then in May, uh, it's beginning uh, to pick up, and uh, now uh, we're uh, projecting that uh, as we uh, continue to move uh, forward, uh, we're gonna be able to start catching up to our uh, normal numbers by uh, August of this year. And the surgical cases uh, have followed the same trend. 
uh, with a uh, marked uh, decrease after uh, February. You see here March, um, April, and now we're beginning to catch up in May, and hopefully we'll, we'll do that. All of this we're doing uh, following the federal guidelines put out by the White House, uh, as well as state uh, guidelines, and then local guidelines that the uh, University of Miami has worked out with the regional local governments to make sure that we have capacity to attend to any surge in the number of COVID uh, patients that need to be cared for. So um, uh, we communicate uh, every morning on a conference call, uh, leaders of all these uh, different uh, groups so to make sure that we uh, share data uh, actively and that we are prepared uh, to take care of patients. We don't wanna see what happened in New York uh, happen in South Florida, which is also a heavily populated area. And uh, this is uh, uh, the phasing in. Uh, and so you can see here that we are uh, uh, phasing in uh, now uh, in, in this month into phase 1B, uh, according to the federal guidelines. And uh, we hope to be into phase two by June 1st, phase three, and then uh, by August 1st, uh, what we call the new normal uh, which would be at a full uh, 100% uh, of what we were doing uh, before. And this is just a uh, 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 the calendar, and here you can see how the different phases uh, will turn out to be with August 1st becoming uh, an area when we can open up. So I know there may be questions. Uh, I know that I'm, I apologize. I only have a few minutes uh, to stay on the call because I have to join uh, another meeting. But uh, Alan, uh, be happy to answer any questions that uh, you may have. Eddie, that's fantastic. Thank you for your talk. I think uh, many people are quite impressed with the setup that you have there. Um, question on where you source the drone soot lamp. Is that something commercially available or did you guys fashion that yourselves? So there are about 50 that we have built. Uh, they have been primarily shipped to India and uh, Africa. But uh, Dr. Jean-Marie Perel, that many of you are aware of uh, him uh, in our biophysics uh, laboratory, I'd be more than happy to share his email. Uh, it's, and, and, and you can write to him. He, uh, they're not FDA approved, so they're actually better uh, to be shipped uh, uh, overseas um, and over the border uh, because they can be used. We're using them on a experimental basis. You know, all, the, all devices in the U.S. have to be FDA approved. Eddie, I was on the rounds at Baskin Palmer when they were talking about the robo uh, slit lamp, the drone slit lamp. I think it's amazing, especially if you want to do outreach in certain areas. I think that that really lends itself for that. And in this situation where you have potentially infectious people, you can, you can be doing the exam from the opposite room, which is quite, quite innovative. Exactly. So uh, an idea that we immediately came to mind for us was to put one of these in the COVID uh, patient care floor of the general hospital so that the nurses could just bring the patients that needed a consult that were not on a respirator but needed an eye consult. They, we could do the exam by uh, uh, remotely. Brilliant. Brilliant. Eddie, I know you have to run. I, I just want to thank you that uh, for sharing your um, what you're doing at Baskin Palmer. I think... Uh, we all have a lot to learn from one another. I'm sorry you can't uh, be on the rest of the call, but it will be recorded if you're interested. We're going to um, have Brant uh, Slamovic, who's going to tell us what's happening in the emergency room, as well as Yvonne Baez from the COS and Wai Ching Lam from Hong Kong. But we'll let you go reluctantly. <laughs> yeah, and, send me, uh, uh, yeah, send me the link to the recording, and I, I will also be happy to read through the chat. And if there's any question in particular, the person in the chat can just leave me their uh, email. Uh, I'll be happy to write back to them. Thanks, Eddie. Thank you so much. Really appreciate okay. your participation. Keep Thank stay you. Stay safe. Stay safe. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks, Eddie. Okay. So moving on, we're going to hold the questions till after um, Brant Slomovic has spoken, and we also want to welcome Brant back to the podium and Brant, the virtual podium. Brant, maybe while I'm introducing you, if you could share your slides or uh, Amandeep, if you have his slides or uh, you can get yeah, his I'll slides show them right now. up. Um, Brant trained in emergency medicine in New York, completed his FRCP at the University of Toronto in 2008, 
and has been on staff at the University Health ne Network ever since. He is the emergency department liaison for stroke care at UHN. His main areas of interest are postgraduate education and ophthalmic emergencies. Brant, could you please update us on what opening up looks like? With pleasure, Alan, thank you. Um, it's always uh, great. First of all, I appreciate the invitation back. It's, uh, it's great to connect and collaborate with the ophthalmology service and also just to have the opportunity to represent and uh, the ED and share, share our experience with you. Um, I'm having some technical difficulties, there we go. Um, so you'd asked me to start by reviewing some of the current ICU data. And um, while I don't wanna to spend uh, too much time laboring on the numbers, um, I think I'll talk briefly about um, the graph, which is similar to the one I showed you a month ago, um, as it represents probably our best understanding of where we are with COVID-19. Um, and as compared to last month, uh, the general trend looks like we're doing quite well. So when I spoke to you back in April, uh, the number for um, COVID positive patients in the ICUs were in the 260 region. And currently now they're sitting slightly lower. Um, and even as of today, I believe they're down the 170 region. So um, I think uh, just to reiterate my point last time that I ended with that uh, we're doing well, uh, I think we have a ways to go. And I think my recommendation um, from the emergency perspective is that we maintain course uh, we continue with social distancing and masking uh, as best we can. And of course, um, from the medicine side, we increase testing as widely as possible. Um, in as far as the future, we're not really talking at this point about plans for a second or third wave. I'm not really convinced that we're out of the first one just yet. Um, and I think, as I mentioned before, uh, as far as the organization goes, we have measures in place um, from an organization perspective uh, to deal with surges which include things like staff relocation and bed designations and expanding our ICU capacity um, for the sickest of the COVID patients. And luckily, um, we have not got to that point where it's part of the discussion. Since last month, I can tell you that um, for us in the eMERGE, times have changed and they've changed dramatically. Um, our routines have changed. Everything from how we prepare to come to work to what we bring with us to work. Um, to how we finish our shift and how we decontaminate ourselves before we return home to our families and um, homes uh, is different. Um, we are now in a system of universal masking in all hospital areas, which is recent. Uh, we wear PPE all the time on a shift, which again is new. Um, we don't do things that we take for granted, such as wearing rings and watches to work anymore, because they are sources of possible transmission of infection. Um, we generally are wearing the same masks and visors for an entire shift. So as you can see here, we have a surgical mask, uh, eye protection, some form of a shield, and a head covering, usually a surgical cap, which are all new to us in the eMERGE. Um, we uh, no longer freely eat or drink, um, and if we do so on breaks, uh, it's usually with some bit of anxiety around safety. Um, we don't take breaks together. There's limitations as to how many people can be in the same staff room at a given time. There are things like procedures um, called code delta, which means that there is a designated team, usually of ICU staff and anesthesia, who do all the intubations for the sickest presumed COVID positive patients. Uh, it is a perpetual challenge to maintain any sort of recommended distance in the workspace. Um, and this is not uh, my intention to portray uh, a bleak situation here in the eMERGE, but it's rather just to tell you that it's simply a new way and a new reality for us. In the eMERGE currently at both sites at UHN, the Western and the General, our volumes are significantly down. And we think that is a result of the fear of coming to the ER being significantly up. Um, we are operating at much lower than usual volumes in the eMERGE. So on a regular eight hour shift, I would see on the average of 20 plus patients per shift. In the last couple of weeks, I can say it's been down to maybe a handful of patients. Um, we wonder often where um, the strokes and the MIs are and the acute infections that um, are part of our daily uh, bread and butter. Um, they don't seem to be coming, which is worrisome. And when you, they do present, um, it's often sort of a delayed presentation, um, which of course is a detriment to the patients in terms of their morbidity and mortality. So my first message from the eMERGE uh, to you is that uh, the ED and we in the ED are safe. Um, and please encourage your patients and your loved ones and family members to not be afraid 
and definitely not to delay seeking care for any significant symptoms. So one of the lessons that I've taken away with this last month and a half from um, this COVID experience is just a new understanding of humility. Um, we have done extremely well in Canada, as I said, um, and I don't think we're out of the woods yet, but there are some things that we were wrong about with this experience. And of course, with the caveat that retrospectively our vision approaches uh, 2020, I could say that, you know, in February when things began and we were hearing rumors in the emerge of what was happening in Wuhan province, many of us actually didn't perceive the problem would ever come to our place, um, certainly not in the speed that it did, and uh, many of us weren't even really paying attention at the time. Um, back at the end of February, our initial screening was extremely limited, and that was to people who had either traveled to or been in contact with someone sick from Wuhan. And I have no doubt um, that we missed some people as we learned about the atypical presentations of COVID and more about the way this absolutely novel virus behaves. Back in March, we were still debating whether we should be wearing masks for all patient encounters. Um, the idea there was to protect valuable resources of equipment. And there were also some people who thought that it doesn't present particularly well if people walk into the emergency room and everyone's wearing masks and shields. Things, times have changed very quickly. In many centers, um, hardest hit with, hit with COVID, um, and I'm specifically referring to our colleagues in Italy and New York City here, the paradigm in emerge of intubating early, which was rightly applicable in the days prior to COVID um, for the most severe respiratory um, illness patients um, proved to be not the best management choice for this particular disease and um, people suffered for that reason but it's part of the learning process for something that's so novel um, in this regard here in toronto we benefited from two things primarily one is we were slightly behind the timeline of new york and italy and we never saw the volumes of such severely ill respiratory cases and two we had the benefit of incredible knowledge sharing from our colleagues all over the world that was happening in real time and often happening on things like social media. This is my eMERGE chief, Dr. Saba, who's given me permission to share the photo with you from just a couple of days ago. Um, so we are still debating whether all admitted patients to the hospital should be swabbed for COVID-19. Um, this remains an area of debate um, as clinical practice for us frequently sidesteps the recommendations that are sent down from infectious control guidelines and bodies. Um, so in other words, those of us practicing on the front line use our clinical acumen and expertise above decision rules. Uh, most importantly, I think I could say that we feel a duty to not only protect our patients and ourselves, but equally our colleagues upstairs. Um, currently at University Health Network, we're undergoing a mass testing initiative for all staff. Um, this is done on a voluntary basis. Uh, and it's really just a, a way to try and get a better understanding of trends and outbreaks in our hospital. Uh, as far as we know, actually UHN, I think, is doing some of the most uh, vigorous testing in the entire province. Um, I would encourage you to please educate your trainees on the proper use of PPE, especially when they are seeing consults from the ED. Uh, in the eMERGE, we consider every patient as a COVID positive until proven otherwise. So surgical masks, eye protection, shields, gowns and gloves for all patients. Uh, the eMERGE um, can be, or if not, is not the, one of the areas of the highest challenge in the hospital. Um, our patients are often having the worst day of their life. Um, many of them don't have their expectations met and they cannot be met. Um, we are generally under-resourced and often understaffed and operating in physical environments that um, do not really meet patients' expectations for privacy nor the um, health and safety of staff. We uh, definitely don't have drone slit lamps yet, but um, perhaps you can assist us with acquisitions from Dr. Alfonso in Florida. Uh, despite all of this, uh, we have found new ways of working through the challenges thrown our way by COVID uh, with incredible resourcefulness and eagerness to engage. And we also have a new way of seeing things in the ED. Um, you've asked me to speak about something positive that has come from the COVID experience, and I'll briefly mention a few. Uh, these are things that I have spent a lot of time with for the last couple of years, but seem uh, even more um, prescient in the moment. Um, so I'm going to piggyback a little bit on the message of uh, Rada and Sarah, and I'd just like to, you to consider the following things, and please take this as an invitation or perhaps a reminder of the things that most of us know, but sometimes uh, may not be at the center of our attention. 
I think we're finally getting real about physician and mental health and well-being. Um, perhaps more now than ever, we need to commit to taking care of ourselves, um, if not already doing so. And unfortunately, uh, it's not a day that goes by where I don't hear of a colleague in one department or another falling ill to something either um, as the slide indicates or um, something in our own institution. So I'd encourage you to either find or re-engage with a passion outside of medicine, not simply as a distraction from what we do, but rather to complement your practice. This is something uh, I've prioritized and has been a proven tonic during uh, these really challenging times for us. I would also say um, reach out to a colleague and see how they're doing if they're basically okay. Um, maybe even a colleague who you don't know all that well. I think you'd be surprised at what people reveal often to those they don't know intimately. And I say establish routines. So regular check-ins with coworkers. I do this on a every couple day basis with selected colleagues. Um, I also use weekly Zoom sessions with family and non-medical friends. And this allows me to stay connected in a time where we feel often isolated. Uh, and maybe also impose some limits on your social media activity, which does not seem to confer the same connectivity uh, in the same meaningful way as some of the other things I've mentioned. And the last thing, and the second thing I'll actually talk about, um, which is a positive outcome, is I'd like to shed some light on some personal observations um, of a level of understanding and empathy in the workplace that in this time of COVID, I find to be unprecedented. And I think we need to carry some of the sentiment forwards. Um, I would encourage you to really think about being kind towards our colleagues, being respectful to those inside and outside of our immediate teams and departments and hospitals. We must operate, I think, from a place of presuming that the other person, the other person on the other end of the phone, the person sending in the consultation, um, is really um, doing the best they can and are probably working or acting from a place of good intentions. I think we can consider that there's always another perspective. I think we should consider that emotion is behind an action rather than making it about the person. And I think it's really imposed upon us to be meticulous about withholding judgment, especially in times of stress. Uh, I think these are essential to longevity and feeling good about the work we do. Um, and it's certainly been something that's changed my practice in the last month. And I'll end with that. Brent, thank you for those wise and kind words. Um, and it highlights the importance of wellness during this time. And um, I also want to thank you and Abdu and all of our frontline colleagues for the incredible hard, hard work um, that you guys have been doing up, um, up until this point, the last two months. I'm going to um, raise a couple questions from the chat. We'll start with Abdu. There was a question here. Um, once we um, relax the lockdown, won't the R not value simply shoot back up? Abdu, you're muted there. Okay, can you hear me now? Thank okay, you. there we go. Uh, that's an excellent question. Um, we hope that that's not the case, but obviously that's a risk if we are complacent and we rush back into our normal degree of interaction with people. We don't re uh, respect distancing. Um, and importantly, if we don't maintain the testing standards that we need to, to make sure we're recognizing uh, the people in the community who represent the background infection rate. Remember up to 40% of people who have COVID-19 have no symptoms at all. I mean, that can't be overstated. So. If we're not maintaining our testing capacity at a very high level and ensuring that our daily case rate is declining in tandem with a proper testing capacity, we have no idea if that second wave is going to be just around the corner and that R naught will shoot right back up. So that's a very valid concern. Another question that we've had from a couple people comes to that uh, aerobically intense activity that you're referring to. Um, we all know about that choir group in Washington. There's been some articles around that. It had to do with not just the intense activity, but also the time exposure. And so a follow-up question to that was around jogging. And uh, given that if, if you are jogging, but passing somebody who's COVID positive, and it is an intense activity, but it's a momentary exposure, 
Um, is that a high risk activity? Is that something we should cease doing at this time? So excellent question. The risk when you're talking about jogging is more actually related to the person around the jogger, not the jogger themselves. So the idea is that when you are doing anything that's aerobically intense, you're actually breathing more heavily, you're potentially releasing a greater number of viral particles in a given breath. So if you're doing that at 25, 30, 35 times a minute, you're going to be potentially releasing some bioaerosols. And based on some of the Belgian data and some other dynamic models that have been done, that is most likely to occur in what's called the slipstream. So somebody who's behind you, if you think about how people ride when they ride in groups, when they're cycling, and they sort of, uh, uh, I don't know what the term is, they try and block wind for each other. I know I've completely slaughtered that, but the idea is that if you're behind them in the same sort of airstream, you're potentially at risk. So what I'm recommending is that joggers themselves should be the ones wearing the masks. They're pretending a greater risk to others rather than the other way around. It also makes me nervous when I hear about gyms and health clubs opening, frankly. Um, you know, I go to an Orange Theory fitness class. I love it. I can't say that I would be thrilled going to one if it were to open in the next few weeks. It's just impossible to keep people distancing at six feet, you know, within a given setting like a gym and people are invariably going to be breathing heavily. Gotcha. So to clarify that then, you're worried about the jogger and the joggers behind, but not so much passing a jogger on a path. If you're going no, I think directions. the likelihood of, uh, you know, a millisecond or two of an exposure is probably very minimal, especially when you talk about some de degree of dispersion through, through the wind in an open space. Great. And there's one more question. I, this can be to either yourself or to Brent, but it's about the Roche antibody test, which um, a couple of people have asked about, but apparently it's very sensitive and very specific. Um, I don't know if you guys know anything about that particular test. Uh, right now in Canada, we don't, we don't have that one uh, rolled out and licensed. Uh, obviously, every manufacturer is going to make claims about uh, the accuracy of their product. Uh, until I hear it from Health Canada, obviously, I can't comment on it being uh, validated within Canada. So as I said, I'm hopeful that the testing characteristics are going to be improved and we'll probably have something very soon. The prospects for that are much better than for a vaccine. I don't know okay, if you have anything actually, to add you know, that, Brent. I'm not sure. I don't know much about it, to be honest. But not more than you, certainly, I do. Brent, I just have a very quick question for you. And that is, you, you kind of mentioned this a little bit, but what about collateral damage? Damage not caused by COVID-19. Damage caused by somebody who should be coming to the emergency room who is not coming to the emergency room. And that may result in either uh, worsening morbidity or even mortality. Is that being looked at when we look at our uh, data in terms of what COVID-19 is doing? Yeah, as far as I know from the research side of things in eMERGE, um, that data is not being captured currently. I think our numbers are still too small, frankly. Um, like I said, the number of visits, if you look at the data from, for example, the Toronto Western Hospital, where in a 72 hour period, we were discharging well over 500, sometimes approximating 600 patients per day. We're now at the 200, 250 mark. So even those that are coming in who are the sickest present basically a handful of patients a week that we presume had they come in earlier um, would have had a better outcome. But again, the numbers are just too small to make any large you know, statements about it. Okay, thank you. I think in the interest of time, we're going to have to move on. And uh, I, I'm hoping that all the panelists will stay around because there, are, you know, we still have 356 people on these rounds. And there are a lot of questions that are popping up. So I'm hoping that I want to try and give everybody uh, uh, a chance to speak. And uh, there are questions uh, that people have. So moving along, I'd like to welcome someone who really needs no welcome in Canadian ophthalmology. That's Dr. Yvonne Baez. She is Professor, Department of Ophthalmology and Vision Sciences at the University of Toronto. She is President of the Canadian Ophthalmological Society, Co-Director of the Glaucoma Unit, University Health Network. 
She has published over 160 peer-reviewed scientific papers and made over 500 presentations. I think uh, I can speak for Canadian ophthalmology as a whole when I say that we all really have appreciated her excellent work spearheading guidelines uh, for the Canadian Ophthalmological Society for safe, ethical, and responsible returning to opening up our ambulatory clinics and operating rooms. And Dr. Baez will be talking about best practices for opening up the ambulatory care clinics. Yvonne? Hey, thank you very much, Alan. So the acute reaction to COVID was to defer elective visits and procedures, which for many of us meant basically stopping all clinical activity unless it was completely necessary. And because of concerted efforts of everyone in our population, we fortunately averted that first surge. And now there's talk about opening up, but the risk of COVID hasn't changed. Until there's a vaccine, the way we run our ophthalmology clinics are gonna need to adapt to this new normal. The normal of January 2020 will likely never be the normal of the future. We need a process to provide patient care in this new normal. Next slide, slide please. Reopening should be cautious, measured, and instructive. Go slow and reassess. We want to avoid a second wave and having to go backwards. Success will depend on the common effort responding to scientific findings related to COVID, but also our patient expectations for changes in how we deliver care. The approach to reopening needs to be individualized. There's no one size fits, size fits all paradigm. However, there are overarching considerations, which I will go through now. Next slide. Although the decision to close was made nationally, the decision to reopen will be local. You'll need to be prepared. You'll need to make sure your staff are able to come back, that you have significant, uh, sufficient supplies for PPE, sanitizers, and disinfectants, for example. Next slide. You're going to need to develop or update your office protocols, and these are gonna to have to be very granular, not just for um, screening of patients and staff, physical distancing, but who's gonna clean the bathrooms and how often? Next slide. We're sitting on a huge backlog of deferred appointments. In addition, we already have future booked appointments. It's not gonna be possible to see all of these patients with the present restrictions and we're gonna to need to continue to triage and consider who should be seen in person and who should be seen virtually. Our traditional paradigms of periodicity of visits should be re-examined and perhaps changed because quite frankly, some of these may have been wasteful. We need to consider our vulnerable patients who are at higher risk and with vision problems being more common in the elderly, we have to be particularly careful as ophthalmologists. What about patients that come from long-term care homes? Some form of screening is gonna be required. Next slide. Screening is gonna to have to start before the visit and you should have a telephone script ready for your staff. So you're going to try to find out if the patient has COVID symptoms or not. Next slide. If they do have COVID symptoms, if the visit is not urgent, either reschedule it or schedule it as a virtual assessment. Next slide. But if it's urgent, these patients still need to be seen. So either you're gonna to try to see them in your office or you're gonna to have to have a designated COVID room and a proper PEE or send them to the emergency. Next slide. If they've screened negative and then they come to the visit, you're gonna to have to screen them again at that visit. And if you allow an accompanied person, that person needs to be screened as well. And if they screen positive, next slide. Again, either have that COVID isolation room set up in your clinic or send them to the emergency. And if they screen negative, then you can, next slide, then you can proceed with the appointment. Next slide. So this risk of COVID hasn't changed and we need to adapt to it and consider the safety of our patients, our staff and ourselves. Scheduling templates will need to consider your waiting room capacity to maintain physical distancing. Patient volumes are gonna to have to be low. Patients should be advised not to arrive early and not to arrive late 
and maybe even wait in their car until you're ready to see them. A company person should be either zero or one. Your waiting room chairs should be separated or roped off and maybe consider putting markings on the floors uh, in front of your reception like we've seen at grocery stores to help to maintain physical distancing. There should be visible access in your waiting room for hand sanitizers for the patients. Remove any loose materials like magazines and flyers. You're also going to need to consider the cleaning frequency of the chairs in your waiting room. And as I've already mentioned, consider designating an isolated room in case a potential COVID patient arrives. Next slide. These principles also need to be extended to our testing areas. Next slide. Offices will need to have a sufficient supply of PPE and staff may require training on donning and doffing to try to reduce self-contamination. Frequent hand washing is gonna be the norm and it probably should be done in front of the patient. Next slide. PPE for us also includes slit lamp breath shields and a plexiglass or similar barrier in front of the reception area for your staff. Next slide. You'll need to ensure that you have a sufficient supply of sanitizers and disinfectants. Many of these things we've already been doing, but now we're gonna require increased diligence. Next slide. And don't forget your diagnostic equipment. There's been a lot of chatter on Aunt I about how to clean these, specifically the visual field. And some of this information is available on the COS Practice Resource Center website. Next slide. So it's a lot of material that I've been covering. And to try to aid the offices, we just today sent out an e-blast on this checklist for reopening your clinic, which covers many of the items I've said and some additional items as well. Also, I've included that flow chart for consideration for screening. Next slide. So finally, Alan wanted one positive. I personally feel there are many positives coming out of COVID. Our waiting rooms are gonna be less crowded. There's gonna be shorter wait times for patients. I think this is gonna enhance the patient experience and it's more respectful for their time. We're gonna have better cleaning of our hands and equipment, which is also gonna be a good outcome. I think this periodicity of well checks is really being challenged and perhaps some of those were actually a bit wasteful. So our whole paradigm of how we change or evaluate patients and the frequency of seeing them is gonna be changed and that might also be good for the system. And this will also include, inc include increased use of teleophthalmology. I've been really impressed with the tempo of learning and I'm hoping that this is gonna start extending into more rapid clinical trials and approval pathways. And finally, we've all seen the risks of using sole sourcing and invest in, investing in domesticating of production of PPE, but also critical drugs may also be a positive outcome of COVID. Thank you. That was excellent, uh, Yvonne, uh, as usual. I think that uh, your point about actually being able to slow down a little bit and talk to your patients, even if it's through a mask, has been something that I've, a mask and a shield, that's something that um, I think a lot of us are experiencing and how much we really enjoy that. I know it started with the telephone consult, how much patients would enjoy or appreciate the call and now it's just the ability to talk to them a little bit. How are you doing? You know, it's how you're doing during, how you're managing during this crisis. And um, I know patients appreciate it, and I certainly have uh, as well. You know, this was something that I'd learned a long time ago from George Spath. He always said he'd sit down with the patient and first say, how are you? How are you? And I think that that's something that we often forget. We're so quick in our um, interactions with patients. and you know, I think we're re-looking at that. And I spend that every time. How are you doing in the situation? And then we get into the eye issues after. Okay, so quick question before we move on. How long will this last? <laughs> 
well, you know, I think you've just heard from the previous talks. Uh, it's frightening that figure that 40% of uh, the community has the virus and doesn't have symptoms. So until we have a vaccine, we're going to have to be operating much differently. And I, what the predictions have been, 12 to 18 months. Okay, thank you so much, Yvonne. I hope uh, everyone will be able to stick around after to just answer any questions. Um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Weiching Lam. Professor Lam is the clinical professor at the University of Hong Kong. He is ophthalmologist in chief of the Queen Mary Hospital in Hong and Hong Kong West Cluster and the Hong Kong University Shenzhen Hospital in Shenzhen, China. Most importantly, he's a dear friend and past associate. And we've uh, asked Dr. Lam to speak to us today about what does opening up look like in Hong Kong? You've gone through it before we have, and please educate us with where you are now and what precautions you're taking and what we can learn from your experience. Well, thank you, Alan. And it's always a pleasure to um, join the uh, Toronto group, and thank you for the invitations. Um, next slide, please. I'm aware of time, so I'm going to try to uh, um, take it through quickly. Um, there are some of the uh, challenges that are uh, very unique in Hong Kong. And uh, uh, the first confirmed COVID case actually was reported in January 23rd. And the uh, majority of the uh, healthcare provided in Hong Kong is through the public system. In fact, 90% of the care is through the public system and only about 10% through the private system as a two-tier system. And there was concern about the crowding of the clinic, the operating room, especially in the, uh, in the waiting room area. And, uh, and the aware, awareness of the necessity to preserve the, uh, the PPE, the personal protective equipment, and, uh, and the N95. Next uh, slide, please. And um, the benefit to Hong Kong is that we has the experience of going through SARS in 2003. So as um, uh, soon as the uh, recognitions of the first case, there was an activation of the emergency, emergency response level um, for um, the hospital to um, start having the uh, reducing surface and uh, controlling access. Um, Hong Kong never was completely shut down and uh, Something unique about Hong Kong is that uh, it's in a very relatively small area with a very large population. Since SARS though, uh, there is a general acceptance of wearing face masks. Um, you can see survey that was done uh, at different time interval from January to now, 90% of the people uh, that was asked were uh, quite happy and willing to wear face masks when they're out in the uh, Public. I think that has made a difference in controlling the, um, the spread of the uh, infections. Next slide, please. And um, I think Dr. Sakari has mentioned some of the uh, issues about SARS and, and the questions about, um, sorry, SARS, the coronavirus. The um, question about the, um, um, the stability or the presence of the coronavirus uh, in the environment, and, um, and we are quite aware about the having it on the surface for up to several days and, uh, and they can also present in the, um, in the stew. In fact, um, in Hong Kong, there's signage in the uh, public uh, toilet to ask people to close the lid when they flushed because of the concern of uh, creating aerosol. Um, maybe it will be interesting to hear from Dr. Satawi afterwards. Um, and the other thing about the, um, the mask and the gloves, particularly the mask and, and uh, there's a public uh, uh, advertisement from the, uh, in TV and, and radio to remind people uh, not to try to touch the mask and then touch the face because the risk of um, uh, the virus uh, staying on the mask uh, can be several hours to days. Next uh, slide, please. And um, there were measures that was taken um, during the um, uh, at first epidemic and now pandemic is uh, uh, restricting certain uh, procedures such as the uh, um, the air puff or non-contact tonometry 
and uh, re uh, reducing the um, or stopping uh, nasal lacrimal procedures and uh, and people, the nurses particularly, who put eye drops and uh, doing irrigations are wearing the protections, uh, particularly wearing eye shields. And some of the procedures such as Botox, which require the patient to take their mask off to have the procedure done, were also stopped. Next slide, please. By the way, I just want to uh, acknowledge that uh, Dr. Kendrick Sik is one of our ophthalmologists has uh, helped to contribute some of the slides and he, in fact, he published some of the uh, uh, measure that is uh, described here in the, um, in the literatures, uh, most recently in May. And uh, you can see that uh, we have reduced our surface to, uh, in surgery about 30% and um, we only have one room out of three that was running, but, um, but we never completely shut down. We still have uh, procedures such as carex done during the, the peak periods of the uh, uh, endemic. And um, the number of cases certainly has significantly reduced from the 96 cases in February to 40 cases in March, compared to normally about 315 cases per month. And um, all, the general, all the elective general anesthesia cases was postponed. And the only cases that was done, if they, meet the criteria of trauma, cancer, uh, transplantations, or risk of irreversible cellular limb losses. So um, in ophthalmology, you can see the, um, the list of um, procedures that were considered as uh, um, urgent and emergent cases. Next slide, please. Um, the measure has been mentioned by the, the different group already, I think particularly from uh, Yvonne. Um, the, um, the protection with um, goggles, uh, surgical masks, and um, having alcohol disinfectant barrier for the slit lamp and the uh, equipment. And this measure need to continue beyond the present uh, time, even in the um, time when we start to so-called reopen up. Next uh, slide, please. For the patient's measures, uh, they're screening at the entrance with uh, temperature measurement and questionnaire. And one thing unique in Hong Kong is that uh, the clinic electronic medical record system is linked to the immigration department of Hong Kong. This allows us to confirm the patient's travel history. In fact, we have caught um, some patients who actually lie about their tra recent travel to, uh, uh, to China and um, so that um, we were able to uh, um, uh, kind of validate their travel history uh, without being caught uh, uh, offhand by the, uh, taking the proper precautions and uh, um, so that um, they will reduce the, uh, the risk to the, um, uh, both the staff and the patients in the surrounding. And um, patient, or, although the, um, in Hong Kong, everybody kind of accepted the universal masking and inside the hospital, mask, face masking was, is a mandatory. If the patient doesn't come in with one, uh, they will be provided. Next slide, please. And um, so with the um, uh, screening, the uh, uh, vigorous quarantine and contact tracing and the universal face masking, um, we have uh, been able to see a um, plateauing, in fact, uh, zero cases for the last 23 days. Uh, next slide. And, uh, but despite that, um, next slide, please. Despite that, for 23 days of zero cases, two days ago, there was three uh, local confirmed cases. So ramping up surface, um, when we were having this stabilization during the uh, kind of mid-April to uh, May, uh, we were starting to push our OPD clinic from 50% to 75% and now almost 90%. And uh, for the elective surgery, we were down to 30%. But um, uh, for last week, uh, the first week uh, uh, of May, we were back up to about 50% by opening an additional half-day sessions. 
And if the current trend remains, we probably going to go to have a two full days, so two full sessions, I mean, of um, operating room, and that will bring us to 75%. And uh, the key for this is just slowing, slowly increasing our capacity to manage the, pay, uh, the case load. But with the increases of the um, uh, clinic and the uh, surgery, the main concern actually is the crowding in the waiting area. Next slide, please. And um, the situation in Hong Kong is different than, um, um, than Canada. So most people actually don't drive to come to the hospital. So we actually, in the hospital that I'm, we are working, um, we created an outdoor waiting area. You can see on the, um, on the screen there. And um, so the patients are not allowed to get into the uh, building uh, until they're about 15 minutes before their actual appointment. And um, Hong Kong at this time of the year is quite hot. And you can see that two big uh, air conditioner was added to provide some cooling for the people who are waiting outside. The temperature today is 29 degrees Celsius. So it's very uncomfortable. Other ways to avoid overcrowding in, in, the, um, in the waiting area is to spread out the patient appointment and uh, allowing only one family member with each patient. And we are also planning to extend the clinic hours from what usually finish at five. Uh, the intention is probably going to push that to six in order to catch up the backlog of patients. We have revealed the number of patients that been uh, postponed to about 2,000 patients that has been put uh, on hold of being have their appointment uh, further delayed. And uh, there's also the plan to open up on Saturday to accommodate some of the increases of um, patients waiting. Next one, next slide, please. And uh, social distance social distancing or physical distancing is uh, happening both at the entrance as well as the registration desk. Next slide. And uh, in, the waiting area, in the waiting area, um, the, uh, the waiting room is reconfigured and uh, chairs or empty space are created between patients. And uh, next slide. And um, for surgery wise, um, so the um, uh, days before the surgery, they usually a phone call by the uh, uh, clerks or the nurses to check their um, history, making sure they're not, they have, don't have fevers and uh, they have no recent travel history to China or other uh, potentially uh, endemic places. And, uh, and that was checked again on the day of the uh, surgery on arrival to the daycare center the day surgery center. And uh, the waiting room also has been reconfigured so that they, all the chairs are facing into one direction to avoid face-to-face -face, um, between the um, uh, situation between the patients and their uh, family members and creating more separate uh, spaces between patients. Next, page, uh, next slide, please. And um, I think the situation that we're facing, especially now if we start to uh, ramming up the surface, is going to be like a roller coaster ride. In Hong Kong, uh, in March, there was a second wave of uh, uh, people returning from uh, abroad and uh, with uh, a surge of cases. Suddenly, there's about 45 cases uh, and, um, and there was the um, concern uh, can we go back first? And, um, and then, um, as I said in the last slide, there is the um, um, reason um, good 23 days of zero cases and suddenly we have three uh, local confirmed cases. So this is going to be seen in your experiences here in Canada and elsewhere too. I think the question, sorry, the, the whether recurrence will occur or not is not a question whether it will or not, is probably when it will happen. So if you are planning to open up, uh, the key word is slowly 
and be vigilant and be flexible. Uh, next slide. So um, I think in closing, um, I, I like to uh, remind us that uh, despite all these kind of uh, bad news of this endemic and how it affect our life and how it affect our patients, I think we will eventually overcome this as we have done in the other uh, past uh, pandemic. And um, we'll come out strong and, and better. Maybe even as um, I think Yvonne alluded to, a cleaner world because of all the attention to the hygiene. And uh, I think the new normal could very well be the wearing the face mask. I think that has happened to Hong Kong since the SARS. And uh, in Hong Kong, people who are feeling unwell when they go outside, they wear face, surgical face masks. And, and that's a norm. And people see that without any concern. So I'd like to uh, thank uh, the group in Toronto and particularly Alan again for the invitation to share the experience that we have in Hong Kong. And I'm um, happy to an answer any questions that's there. Thank you so much, Wai Ching. I think that that was excellent and um, puts a beautiful ending onto uh, a very informative Grand Rounds. I think it's thanks to the um, wonderful Grand Rounds team with Sharif, Amandeep, John, and myself, and um, also wonderful speakers. I'd like to thank Radha, Abdul, Brandt, Eddie Alfonso, Yvonne, and yourself, Wai Ching. We still have significantly more than 300 people online. So I think we've gone over, but uh, there's a lot to learn and a lot to say about uh, COVID-19 and opening up. I think we'll officially end rounds at this point. I will ask all of the panel members, however, if they wouldn't mind just staying around a little bit to answer some of the questions and I'll hand over to Amandeep. Yeah, so <clears throat> I wanna thank all of our great speakers again today. Uh, Abdu, Brandt, Yvonne, Weiching, uh, your talks were excellent. There was a number of questions. Some of them have actually already been addressed in the chat box, so I thank you guys for going in there and addressing some of those. Um, there's a lot of questions around uh, what's an aerosol generating procedure, and some of this information is actually available at the COS website on the PRC, so there's a plug for that. Uh, I would encourage you all to check that. And there's also discussion around some things that we don't really have answers for yet. Um, for example, um, bilateral surgery. Um, and I think this is something that we um, are going to have to figure out as, as, as a um, discipline, as a, and we're gonna have to work with industry on that one. Uh, I do see some comments here that it's very, very common already in Quebec. Um, and so we may be able to learn from the experience of other regions. Uh, so th thank you uh, for pointing that out. Um, Abdu, there were some questions here and, and specifically about Sweden. And unfortunately, your answer had gone just to the panelists. So maybe I'll let you take that one back to the general audience. Sure. So um, Sweden has really benefited from Thank a you, sort of clever marketing job here um, where the impression has been given that somehow they have uh, gotten through this uh, with very little damage. Uh, both from a mortality standpoint or an economic standpoint, and actually nothing could be further from the truth. Um, so the, the point in Sweden is that they allowed most of their public institutions to remain open. Uh, they did encourage people to maintain distancing, um, and they tried to sort of invoke this concept of herd immunity, hopefully serving them well, but all the while, the data really doesn't uh, pan out as being particularly helpful. Uh, until not long ago, Sweden had about the fifth highest death rate per million in the world. So they're not improving from a mortality standpoint at all. Um, they have some of the highest rates of uh, mortality in their long-term care institutions in the world, um, about 60%. Uh, that's not a success from my point of view. Uh, why is there are not potentially lower than other places? Uh, about 55% of households in Sweden are single person households. It's a lot easier to maintain distancing when there's only one person in your home as opposed to four or five, for example. And 
from an economic standpoint, there's been a serious uh, increase in unemployment. Uh, their uh, financial sector has taken a pretty significant hit, probably not as bad as a lot of other countries, but to say that they were relatively unscathed by this is a gross misrepresentation of reality. Thank you. And there was another question for you that you had addressed uh, in the chat, but it went to just the panelists, right? It, it, people are asking about why some people have are, are asymptomatic and others um, are dying from COVID. So you, you, you touched on this, but maybe you can answer that for the whole audience. Yeah, so this, a... this is a multifactorial thing. Um, you know, there's certainly several strains of SARS-CoV-2. Uh, there were two that are identified very early on in the pandemic. And there's thought that there's at least five and potentially more. So the actual uh, genotypic and phenotypic characteristics are going to differ uh, depending on your particular exposure. The amount of exposure is obviously going to be important. So if you're across a work colleague and you happen to uh, you know, get infected because of a five minute conversation, that's going to be different than if you were doing a high risk medical procedure, obviously, and you weren't properly uh, using your PPE. Uh, similarly, the uh, individual immune status is going to have a lot to say about this too. It seems that people do the, the, who do the worst with this are those that are either on the extreme of immune compromised or um, in terms of having an autoimmune diathesis. So a lot of the damage that's being inflicted by COVID-19 is a reflection of some of the inflammatory cascades that are happening and the degree of immune dysregulation that's occurring. And that's obviously going to vary significantly based on the host that is infected by this. So you're going to run the gamut from being completely asymptomatic to widespread ARDS, full-blown cytokine storms, and multi-organ failure. Okay. And from, there's a few UHN docs on this call, uh, so I'll throw, throw, throw it out to everyone. But is UHN doing pre-op COVID testing for all surgical patients? And the follow-up question is, what about asking patients to self-isolate for 14 days before elective surgery? So I can answer from what I'm aware of. Uh, I don't believe that there is a specific policy directive uh, pre-op. I will say that in speaking to my surgical colleagues and knowing what's going on within the internal medicine and subspecialty part of UHN, most of us are actually employing a very liberal testing strategy. There are some, including myself, who test every single hospitalized patient. I know that some uh, find that maybe uh, perhaps overcautious and don't think that this is necessarily cost effective. I would argue that at least 15 to 20% of the patients that a lot of us have identified in the last month have been done on patients who exhibit absolutely no symptoms, who've had no travel history, who've had no particular exposure history. So you can call it heightened paranoia. I call it a heightened sensitivity to something that's very elusive that has been very difficult to identify. And I think it has informed our practice by ensuring that we have probably prevented transmission of disease, both within the hospital and at home. Uh, in terms of self-isolating patients, obviously this is something that we place a burden of trust on the individual patient on. And we have to assume that if they're going home, they're going to uh, take the precautions that are necessary, but obviously you can't follow that up. Uh, beyond the advice that you give and trying to ensure that public health is also contacted. So um, I operate at Toronto Western and the rule right now is if you're going to do a elective surgery and we're not doing real elective surgery yet, patients have to be tested before surgery. So they get tested about 48 hours before and then they're told to self-isolate at home until they come in for surgery. I had an emergency surgery I had to do. They could not wait. So the patient was tested just before they went into the operating room. We did the surgery in the COVID operating room with all the precautions. 
Um, it's actually, they're very good at our hospital. We have um, people there that help us with donning and doffing. And you think it's so easy to take uh, the stuff on and off. It's not if you're not used to it. And it's uh, all kind of a scary environment that you're working in. But as I said, the patient was totally isolated, was tested before the surgery, and then had the surgery so that we would know afterwards if there was an issue. Yeah. There's a great comment here from Steve Kraft, uh, who said that his, his, he's got a friend who's a Swedish, Swedish physician, uh, who says that the reality on the ground in Sweden may not be as bad in terms, um, or may not be so different from ours. Um, many restaurants did not stay open, many, re many businesses did close, so they did practice um, some physical distancing. And I think that may be reflective of um, sometimes the sensationalist headlines. I know we've seen some from the Toronto Western, uh, regarding the Toronto Western this week, so uh, we, maybe we'll give them uh, the benefit of the doubt there. Um, but the mortality rate is not up for debate. The mortality right. outcomes are not exemplary by any metric. Uh, imaginable. So that I take issue with, but I'm, I'm glad to hear somebody who has an in-person perspective that's valuable to hear. Right. And there's, I mean, there's a lot of questions about what's practical for, uh, let's say, community physicians, solo practice physicians in terms of PPE um, and what, um, what they should be doing in terms of gowns and gloves and eye protection. Does anybody want to tackle that? What's the, what would be the standard? And are, are you changing in between each patient? That's come up as well. Okay, I can try a little bit about that. It's difficult when you use the word, what's practical? So we have to do what's going to be safe for us, our staff, our patients. And you also have to think of the legal consequences too. Because if you don't do what is deemed to be uh, the the lowest common denominator type of PPE, and you have an outbreak that could be traced back to your office, you're going to be in trouble. So I, I think that to talk about community or hospital base, I don't think that there's going to be much of a difference there. So I, everyone should be wearing some type of a mask, a lot of debate, should it be an N95 or a surgical mask, a minimum of surgical mask. For us in ophthalmology, very hard to wear those shields in front. I cannot examine like that, so I choose not to do that. I also am not wearing goggles over my glasses, but I am wearing my glasses, and I have the breath shield on the slit lamp, which I find helpful. I haven't been wearing gloves. I started the first week wearing gloves. I found it very difficult, so I'm not wearing gloves, but I'm washing my hands all the time. My hands are absolutely killing. They're breaking out and cuts on them because of way too much hand washing. Now, about clothing. So I find it personally easier to come in the office and put on scrubs and wear mm -hmm. that at the end of the day, take the scrubs off, they're brought down to the cleaning area and I take my street clothes, I wear my street clothes home. I've heard other people who wear their street clothes and then when they get home, they immediately take everything off, throw it in the washing machine for the next day. I think it would be easier to wear scrubs and I think you should consider for your staff buying them some type of a thing like that too and either have them responsible for washing it every day or you get a service to wash it. It will just, um, I think, just make things easier. Yeah, someone also asked how often do you take it on and off? So at the Western, we are apparently given two sets of masks a day, which I have not seen. So actually, I have been purchasing my own masks, despite all the propaganda. And um, they say you could, and I wear the mask throughout the day, unless it gets soiled, and then I would change it. So I'm not changing that for every patient. I don't know, Great I'm doing points. more of the expert in this. <laughs> what am I doing wrong? <laughs> for those of you wearing gloves, do you use alcohol to wash your gloves, or you just change gloves all the time? I mean, I would argue that alcohol on the gloves degrades the quality of the gloves. Um, so I, I don't think that's a great idea. I think, I mean, um, they're really not serving their purpose and might be harmful if they're giving you false security at that point. Yeah. Who are you wearing the gloves for? To protect yourself or the patient? Then you have to change them between each patient. You shouldn't be washing them and wearing the same gloves. 
So I just found it all very cumbersome and I chose just to wash my hands thoroughly before and after each patient and I do it in their eyesight. Yeah, I would, I would agree. Uh, you know, wearing gloves is not a substitute for hand washing and it's potentially harmful. It's just an extension of your skin uh, effectively and you can't reliably wash gloves with hand sanitizer or soap. Okay, because but also echo, will... echo the comment on the scrubs. I think it's really important that we come to work and change into scrubs. The days of arriving to work in scrubs are long gone. And I also think that even if you're going to wear scrubs from home and then change into another pair at work, that's not that's not a great idea because of the perception it gives the public, right? To see doctors doctors or healthcare workers out in public in scrubs um, does not lend confidence to uh, the general public. I, I would agree with that, actually. Like I said in my talk, um, I was not one who normally wore scrubs for emerge shifts. I would wear my own shoes and pants, usually with the scrub top, um, and things are different. I only work in scrubs, and I think everyone develops over time their own sense of what they're comfortable with, and I've heard all kinds of stuff from people leaving most of their belongings in the garage or you know, having some sort of bleach solution to wash their shoes down. I don't try and transmit anything from outside the house into my house. So I have a fairly regimented routine, um, which you just have to figure out what works for you. But my shoes never come into the house that I go to the work. And also uh, the minute I get home, everything comes off at the door um, as I walk in into a bag and that whole bag goes right into the washing machine. What do you wash down your uh, Amazon boxes with? <laughs> I don't. <laughs> There's no need to wash down your Amazon boxes. There's really little need to really wipe down any packaging. It's unlikely going to aerosolize from there. So unless you're sniffing or licking your packaging, you're probably pretty safe. You should just be washing your hands. But what about touching a fomite and, you know, you should be washing your hands and not touching your face. That's, That's a given. exactly it. But, but, you know, the average person touches their face uh, 24 times an hour. And I think that was your figure. I saw you on CTV. Uh, I'm not sure, but I think so. And, um, you know, sometimes it's unconscious. So I know people who don't touch their Amazon or their grocery or their whatever they get in a box. They leave it in the outside or wherever they can for at least a day, and then they take it in. Any... Uh, you know, at the, at the end of the day, you have to do what works for you from the point of preserving your sanity <laughs> and making sure you're not crippled by fear. I don't know if Ike is still in the audience here, but him and I joke about this because I think he's one of the more obsessive ones when it comes to wiping things down. You know, you're right that we might do a lot of these things unconsciously, but one of the good things about this pandemic is trying to make yourself more conscious about hand mm -hmm. hygiene becoming more conscious of not touching your mucous membranes and improving upon that. So the idea is during that few minutes where you're uh, unpackaging whatever it is, you should be especially aware of where your hands are. You should dispose of that packaging immediately and then wash your hands immediately and just make it a routine. And once you do that, it'll become second nature and instinctive. I just I wanted to bring up one thing that I saw in the questions. Sheldon Golhar asked, what do I do if someone calls me and says, a patient I saw two days ago screen positive? And I think that's something that we haven't discussed and something that's very important. Um, again, I mentioned you have to think of all your office policies and procedures. And EPSO had a medical legal thing last night. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to attend it, but I was talking to someone else who did, and they were really pushing having good office policies and procedures. And you need one for contact tracing. So you ha have to be able to know if you had a patient there two uh, days ago, you and your staff should probably all get tested. Hopefully you can get tested quickly so you can get back to work and then be able to trace everyone who had been through your office at that time. Um, now we're fortunate at the Western that we can get tested and know within 24 hours. Uh, what would you say if you weren't in that situation and you were tested and you had no symptoms, would it be okay still to work or should you self-isolate for two weeks before you went back? 
Yeah, that's a difficult question. And I think you have to really examine it in the context of the actual exposure itself. How close were you to the patient? Was there a lot of talking? How long was the visit with the patient? Um, and if you can't get your result in a timely fashion, unfortunately, the default is going to have to be that you self-isolate um, and hopefully not for an entire two weeks. Um, now, even though at the Western we're kind of spoiled in terms of the turnaround time being 12 to 24 hours, uh, if you're a healthcare worker, um, you can ensure that that is uh, mentioned when the test is done and wherever the test is being done, it is supposed to receive prioritization. So you should not be waiting for a test result to come back later than two or three days at the most yeah. if you're a healthcare worker, regardless of where you are. Yeah, no, I had a secretary who felt she had COVID. So she went to get tested, took her over a week. She still hadn't heard. So I told her, go to UHN, 24 hours. We knew she was okay. Holiday's over. But Yvonne, aren't we saying that we, when we wear our PPEs and we take all these precautions, we are protecting our patients and ourselves. I mean, Brad said it earlier on, he, take, he treats every patient like they have mm -hmm. COVID. So, I mean, yeah. if we're taking all these precautions, um, I mean, do we really have to self-isolate? I know Anthony Fauci did, but yeah. he wasn't wearing face masks when he was talking and there, were, there was opportunity for, for spread. We, when we, whenever we are with a patient, which is the question mm -hmm. Sheldon was asking, we are wearing either gloves or washing our hands in your case. Uh, you know, I usually wear a hat, I usually wear scrubs and I wear goggles. So the protection is not just for me, it's for my patients. Yeah. So do we so, really so need to my, isolate? We well, are my, doing all that. My understanding of the UHN rules were that as physicians and also all healthcare workers, they expected us to come back to work if we didn't have symptoms get tested and work um, because there was concern of a shortage of staff, right? Uh, my, the other issue though is not anymore. The other issue though is medical legal, you know? So if you had an exposure and then God forbid you did have it, but you didn't have symptoms and then you spread it, I think you could put yourself at big risk, medical legal risk. Yeah, the idea of uh, being at work if you're COVID positive, if you're not symptomatic, just doesn't make any sense. Uh, never mind from a medical legal standpoint, from, a, from an ethical standpoint, given what we know about transmission, uh, it's a prohibitive risk. So at this point in time, the policy is if you've tested positive, you have to be self-isolated for 14 days, or if you happen to be symptomatic until those symptoms resolve, whichever is longer. Couple questions here from the from the audience about requiring patients to wear masks. So, I guess it's two questions. Is number one, can you have an office policy? I know White Ching has, has said yes. Uh, can, can you can you enforce patients to wear masks? And if a patient shows up without a mask, can you charge them for uh, a mask? I'm assuming at cost, maybe with some sort of admin fee. But um, can, can you pass on that charge to patients? Yeah, so there's um, someone from Alberta. She's no, she's from no Manitoba, Winnipeg, and she is putting out a thing to all her patients. They have to come with a mask. If they don't have a mask, they will be sold one for two dollars. If they refuse to wear it, they can reschedule their appointment. Two dollars is cheap. <laughs> <laughs> you should see what they're going for on eBay. Yeah. Now uh, Guillermo, give her number uh, how you know? Some? All of you know Guillermo, right? So in his office, what he's done is his wife, I guess, sewed a whole bunch of masks. They have over 100 there. And they give those to the patients. They're cloth masks, though. And then they wash them at the end of the day. So another way. Uh, the other problem I have at UHN, and I brought it up already to Jan Newton, is I see many patients coming in with masks with those exhale valves on. They might as well not be wearing a mask. And I think that as they come into the hospital, they should be automatically given a second mask. Hasn't happened yet here. I only brought it up last week, so hopefully soon. At, at UHN, I think, I think you're that's not the allowed to policy. wear cloth masks. If you're a patient or a visitor, they will provide you with a surgical mask on entry. Yeah. I'm talking about the masks that have the exhale valve. Oh, yeah. 
Those are coming. Abdu, through. actually, can I can I ask you that question because it's come up in the chat. So, Abdu, are you saying at UHN all patients are wearing surgical masks? Yes, and even uh, visitors. If you not if you, surgical, it's a transition mask, and they just told us that today. So I don't know what the heck that mask is good for. Did you see that? So it's not. It, they are given a mask, but it, right now it is not a surgical grade mask that they're given. Just want to say in Hong Kong. We do exactly what you just said. If patients come in with those Excel valve, they, they are not allowed to wear them and yeah. they will switch to a surgical mask. And uh, in Hong Kong, most people do have access to uh, surgical masks. So if, by, by the, by the situ if the situation is such that the patient doesn't have one, the hospital will provide one. And, and in fact, the hospital provide three surgical masks for all the staffs, um, one to use coming in one during lunch times they switched and one to go home. And uh, so, uh, so everybody is mandatory to wear face mask uh, in the hospital. And it, that was mandatory since day one, since, uh, since January. So that so might have problem, believe The problem we also face though, is the mask that they're giving them right now, this, it's called some transition mask, I don't know, mm -hmm. but a lot of the masks fogging up their glasses. And then you're trying to measure their vision. I found that that has been incredibly difficult to do right now. And if someone has another recommendation of how we can start measuring vision better, it's a bit of a problem. I think Elaine Wu had put that on Aunt I as well. So Abdu, many offices are suggesting patients come in wearing a cloth mask. Would you, so is that better than nothing if they can't provide them um, if, if they don't have the resources to, to acquire surgical masks for all patients? Hello? I think he's frozen. He's frozen. Okay. All right. As far as I know, what's happening at the Western as of two days ago is the mask that patients and even staff are getting at the front door is what's called a level one surgical mask. So there's three mm -hmm. stages of surgical masks which has to do primarily with, with splash resistance. So as frontline care workers, we're given a mask at the door, but we're asked to switch to a different level of surgical mask once we start seeing patients. But for the patients that come in, they're getting the same masks as we are. They're transition only for staff who need to use higher protection for splash when seeing patients. But for patients, they're level one surgical masks and they should be adequate. Abdi, right, you can correct me if I'm wrong, if you're not frozen. <laughs> He looks frozen. We've gone way over time. I want to thank everyone uh, for their participation, especially Wai Ching. I know it's almost 2.15 in the morning uh, in Hong Kong. It's so thank Friday you for, night. So. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank, you for, thank you for staying with us. I want to thank Brant and uh, Abdu and Yvonne. I also want to thank Eddie Alfonso, who um, was on the call earlier. And Rada and Sarah, especially, thank you for your talk on wellness. It's really, really important during this time. So thank mm -hmm. you for sharing those personal insights. And Sarah, on behalf of all of us as faculty, thank you and the residents for doing all that you do. You guys uh, carry the, the burden of this department during normal times, but especially during this time. So thank you for your hard work and we, we do appreciate you guys. Great, thanks, thanks everybody. Guys. Thank you everyone. Thanks. Stay safe. Yes, thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.